have a lot of people joining us. So thank you everyone for joining. We will start the session in five minutes, in one or two minutes maximum. Cassandra, yes, maybe I can start and he will join us. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us, for joining Berkeley Global Society today. It will be the second day of an eSport series initiated by Cassandra. Mathilde Fernandez, and this is a joint session articulated by the Institute of uh, Entertainment and Sports plus the Institute of Arbitration. So a few words about Cassandra, since she will be the moderator, uh, I wanted to, to introduce her today. So Cassandra is a general counsel at the Global Lottery Monitoring System. Cassandra, you are also teaching esports at Aix Marseille University. You have been working for the Council of Europe, and very recently you were admitted at the Californian Bar. So once again, congratulations. But I also would like to take this opportunity, Cassandra, to thank you because you have launched and you are managing the Institute of Entertainment and Sport for almost now one year. It's a great success. You have established a great partnership, including with the Council of Europe, and you have now many fellows and people uh, attending those sessions. So we are learning a lot from you. And we will also learn a lot today from the people who joined you in order once again to talk about eSport. My last word is to thank all the people working behind the screen. So for the programmation, for the uh, social media, etc. And also a last thank for the partner the uh, CSCF, the Foundation for Sport Integrity, as well as this uh, event partner, which is GLMS. So Cassandra, thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Aubin. Um, I am hopefully soon to be admitted, but that, thank you for the very kind uh, words. So good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm so delighted to be here uh, today to speak about this fascinating subject that um, so many of you obviously have heard about in the domain, uh, in sports, whether you're actively interested or even in passing. And um, Yes, we actually started it yesterday, this series, with an introduction to esports with some super interesting panelists. And today, in a little while, I'm going to present to you today's panelists, who I'm so privileged to share the, uh, the screen with. Um, and so why, why are we talking about this topic? We're talking about it because um, there are a lot of issues in esports, which is a growing uh, activity which don't yet have answers. We don't try and bring the answers today, but we try and raise some of the the possible um, possible solutions, possible different activities that are happening, and um, to 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 make this environment of esports a sustainable environment for players, for teams, and for the activity in itself, and all the other activities that are related to team uh, to esports. Um, we will try and look at some legal issues, um, whether they're contractual between players and teams, but mostly we're going to be looking at the organization of esports. Um, in it because it's such a giant industry. Um, I, I've come up with some figures that I found. They're more or less on the same level across the board, where you can see that it's about one. There will be. It's estimated to be worth about 1.8 billion dollars in just a couple of years or so, and it's attracting a massive audience. Um, across the world, uh, I think that uh, COVID uh, might have helped. Uh, also this in this sense because of other sports being uh, suspended for a while last year. So um, yeah, it's a very big scene and we have a lot going on. So um, now I would like to introduce you to our panelists. So I will start with um, uh, Tatiana uh, Vassin, who is uh, on the right of my screen. So um, 
she is a French lawyer specialized in sports law and business law. Um, she's an alumna as well of the um, Master in Sports Law from the Center of Sports Law at Aix-Marseille University. Um, and she's the director of the Paris Sports Master at the Institut Supérieur du Droit uh, and co-responsible um, co for the Paris Bar Sports Law Commission and author of various books, some of which I have had the pleasure of reading. And she uh, attends, defends and counsels sports actors in France and all around the world. And if I remember right as well at the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Um, so welcome, Tatiana. Thank you, Cassandra. Um, um, and then we have also next um, Vlad Marinescu, who is the president of the International Esports Federation, um, also chief media and marketing officer of the International Judo Federation, uh, and president of the United States Esports Federation and found time to be here today. Uh, so he works at, in international sport for over 15 years. He's uh, Romanian born, American raised and studied in Budapest. So globetrotter. And he worked through each level of sports organizations from athlete to event uh, organizer in all departments to managing sports organizations and the business. And um, one of the most interesting facts I found out uh, about you, Vlad, is that you were awarded next 10 on the 30 by Sport Business, which, uh, which is a really fantastic uh, achievement. And then finally, we have our third panelist, last but not least, who is Abdurrahman Mohammed, who is an e-sport entrepreneur based out of Dubai, uh, working in the industry for over a decade as well and running events and organizing esports events around the UAE. He's also a member board of advisory for the Emirates Esports Association uh, and a team member for the e UAE Esports uh, National Team. So we're here with some really interesting speakers who have about a decade of experience in all these topics and I'm very excited to be here today. So welcome all of you today. Thank you for such a nice introduction, Cassandra, <laughs> and for the invitation. Yeah, thank you for having us. So I'm very excited to get started because now we have basically quite a few continents represented around here. Um, and maybe we could kick off um, again in the same order by um, having a little more input from you, uh, Tatiana, on how you see the organization of esports in general and um, your experience, be it in France or in the region. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cassandra. Uh, esports is a, is a very interesting topic from a legal perspective because esports is, uh, is growing, but there are still questions about its organizations and it's normal. Um, one of the most important questions is uh, will esports uh, auto regulate itself or shall it count uh, on uh, federal organization? Uh, both perspectives are possible, but the choice of one rather than another will impact its, de its development, legally speaking. So esports has um, several choices. Follow the world of traditional sports with a specific organization, uh, like the sport organization with a, a pyramidal one. Or will it, will it, at least for one of the part of esports, remain independent from esports federal organizations? It's a, it's a huge topic because uh, esports developed uh, with um, private organizations, uh, with uh, rights owner uh, publishers. And um, I, I think it's almost the, the, the way sports, traditional sports at least, develop themselves. With, uh, with practitioners and at first without uh, federal organization. So it's very interesting to see how, uh, how it works today. Um, I, I think we are uh, looking at what uh, some of us looked for other sports. And it's, uh, it's really interesting because for eSport, there's no one way. There can be one, two, three, three ways of developing. Uh, the ways are not necessarily exclusive. You can have uh, different ways of development. You can have uh, different ways of collaboration. So I think it's very, very interesting. And I think we really have the chance today to have uh, the part for the federal, uh, federal organization. 
and uh, the other part from a uh, private organization because uh, they can work together, they can uh, maybe not work together, but I think they have the same goal, which is developing esports and make esports very, very huge. So um, maybe, maybe they will uh, complete what I say, maybe they will uh, uh, have their, their own point of view, maybe we have a, a way to, 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 to be on the same line. So I'm, I'm really looking for their, their position. Thank, uh, thank you, Tatiana. So um, on your point of whether they follow the, tr the world of traditional sports as in pyramidal or will some parts remain independent, Vlad, I turn to you. Could you tell us a little about the way the I IESF is, um, is structured? And um, this possibly starts answering, I guess, part of um, Tatiana's point that she just raised. How do you see it being on? Yes, thank you, Cassandra. And it's a pleasure to be here during this panel. Uh, with the panelists together, I think we bring together a baggage of knowledge and experience to really debate these topics from all points of view, from a legal perspective, from an event organizer perspective, and from an international federation perspective. So I am the president of the International Esports Federation, which was founded in 2008 by nine national federations. Today, we have as members more than 100 national federations. And from these national federations, I'd like to emphasize that these are I think what Tatiana was referring to as federal or federations type organizations, meaning they're non-for-profit organizations in their respective countries in charge of undergoing esports activities. Out of the 100, a majority of them are already recognized by their ministries of sport and by their Olympic committee or both to undertake that activity recognized as that authority in that country for esports activity. Now the ISF is the International Federation comprised of national federations has of course elected officials onto the board and as well as of course as the president. And through our activities, what we aim to do of course is to unite the world of eSport, to bridge that gap because I don't think that our activities are in any way hurting each other. Rather, they are moving towards the point of protecting athletes, developing the industry and giving to the whole movement a legitimacy. So we have been organizing the world championships from 2008 every year, the world championships have had many games inside. This year, I'm pleased and proud to say that in the first registration already, we have 85 countries participating in the world championships that will have inside of it five different disciplines, five different games. Besides the world championships, we're also organizing the Global Esports Executive Summit, which is the meeting where national federations and stakeholders from the esports industries are coming together to exchange and to find a way to develop the market in a sustainable way to unify and to really create a benefit for this industry. Moreover, importantly than that, of course, a benefit to protect the athletes. And that's my third point I wanted to say about the ISF is that our main target is to educate the youth. At the beginning, Cassandra mentioned that the industry or the esports industry is over a billion dollars. It's very important also to mention that gaming as an industry has surpassed $170 billion last year. So we're speaking about an industry which is bigger than all movies, all music, and all sports combined in terms of value, in terms of market. Uh, the final thing I'd like to add is of course, legitimacy. So the ISF is in process of being recognized as a member of the Global Association of International Sports Federations, where all of the international federations from traditional sports our members, all the Olympic Summer Federations, Olympic Winter Federations, Olympic Recognized Federations, and Independent Federations. And that's a process that we have to go forward, but to end this first intervention, I think that definitely unity, cohesion, and cooperation across all stakeholders in the esports field is vital. We have the same objective, the same purpose, and together we can really make this market develop in a sustainable way and in a healthy way for the kids, the athletes who are participating to compete freely. Thanks so much, Vlad. That's um, it's really fascinating and enlightening to to hear that from you about the explanation of how you're organizing and the, and especially um, there's a lot to unpack actually out of what you said, including about yes the relationship with the the Olympic Games, uh, the Olymp International Olympic Committee, um, and also your your recognition at national level with um, by ministries. So this is really interesting that some of them have already started to be recognized by NOCs as well and by ministries, you say. 
Um, so even the majority now, have already been recognized. The majority and the rest are on wow. the way. Wow, this is this is really interesting. And I mean, I will use that to bounce to our third speaker, um, Abdurrahman. Choco Dubai being your uh, gamer name. Um, so I wanted to ask you because there is a federation in the UAE as well. Um, and you also organize um, tournaments uh, and competitions. I've seen a couple of, I've been to a couple of them. Um, but um, so can you tell me how is it that um, it happens in Dubai? How do you do it? What's your experience? What's happening with with um, with the development of organization of these sports competitions out there. Uh, <clears throat> that's that's a that's a, a very big question. Could you hear me? Can you hear me good? Perfect. Uh, so, where do we begin? I mean, when it comes to esports in the UAE and the development of esports. Uh, you know, we've been we've been organizing and running events uh, as many others around the world since, let's say, around 2000, 2001, 2002, with the birth of esports. You know, back in the day, we were playing on uh, PCs, LAN parties, and, and cyber cafes. Uh, that was the dawn of esports. Uh, and over the years, obviously, it evolved into console gaming, mobile gaming. Uh, and uh, PC gaming. Uh, with the UAE in particular, since I am here and I've been in the industry since the beginning, uh, we've seen different different uh, uh, periods and eras. You know, at one point we were the lead in esports in the region back in the early two thousands, and then kind of things slowed down a little bit. As my generation, we kind of all grew and went to universities and, you know, we had that break in between and came back, uh, started picking things up again. Uh, at that time, other countries around us started moving ahead of us and, and surpassing the UAE uh, when it comes to esport development. Uh, but we're, we're finally kind of picking up the government and, and all the entities around us are coming hand in hand supporting and recognizing the importance of esports right now as as not not the next thing but it is the present right now it is the world we live in it is something that is happening that's something that is actively uh being involved in with all the youth and gamers uh professional gamers uh so we we you know we as you said we have a federation that was launched we have a, the emirates esports association recognized by the sports authority as a as a uh, official association that is our role is to grow and nurture and support all esports and all the pro gamers and the gamers that want to be come pro gamers so that we started that journey from 2015 and you know and and it's still it takes time the issue is we're we're in a very kind of delicate region because for the longest time the Middle East was not a main focus when it comes to esport, when it comes to publishers and games. But over the years, we started becoming a very main integral part of the ecosystem. So forth, we're seeing a lot of the major events happen here in the UAE. A lot of the major global events happen in Dubai. Uh, so it's, it's a process. It's a long, you know, it's a long process, but we're moving, you know, we're, we're, we're developing, we're opening, uh, there are, we have teams, we have professional teams, we have professional players that are, uh, you know, recognized, uh, in, as an international level. So, um, ex uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Abdurrahman. So can you, um, so maybe I direct the next question a little to you and to Vlad, because um, if, uh, and please correct me if I'm mistaken, but um, so with the ISF, there is a national member in the UAE, correct? Yes. Um, so how do they work? Um, how, they, how do they interact? So please, um, basically what I'm asking is the Emirates Esports Association, um, your national federation, is it, the, uh, did you, is it the same thing? Or if not, how do they interact with each other? Um, and then, 
upwards, you know, for, for what concerns the IESF, how does it interact upwards that way? I'm just curious in terms of when you then go to organizing uh, competitions in the region. So uh, with the Emirates Esports Association, as I said, we are recognized as a, as a government entity, as, as the official esports uh, association. Uh, and we are a member of the international esports. The UAE is a member. And uh, so our relationship with the international esports, basically when it comes to uh, competing and, and, uh, and on the world championship that is held every year by the ISF, and so as a member, as a member country, you know, we, there are rules and regulations and guidelines that we follow and we need to be part of a certain number of tournaments and events that needs to take place in order for the UAE to be part of the ISF and to even be part of the world championships, you know. Uh, so we get our guidelines, we get the regulations. So we, we get this when it comes to the International World Championship Series. Now, on our level here as organizers, so I'm as, when I, as a TO, as an organizer, there are certain guidelines and regulations that we need to follow that came from the Emirates Association, Emirates Esports Association, uh, in, in, in ways to safeguard the integrity and to safeguard the players' uh, uh, rights when it comes to, you know, what they, what they have to get and uh, the conditions, the atmosphere, even the prize money, and you know, so many things that needs to be made. We make sure that is is on point, so that there is no issues when it comes to the tournaments that we run and so forth. So a lot of the when organizers want to run a tournament, they come to the Emirates Esports Association. Uh, they submit, uh, you know, their 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 event, and we see who is working on it, what are the guidelines, and so forth. Just again, it's part of the making sure that everything stays at, uh, on, a, on a certain level. Thank you. Vlad, do you have uh, anything to add in particular to that question? The most important thing is that the, I think that that's a very valid point. And also we're very fortunate to have on our board at the ISF level, Sheikh Sultan uh, be a board member who was elected also two years ago. And the strategy for running the world championship is really bringing the national teams, the best of the best from each country who are representing the national team. And this allows us the possibility that each national team can run their national qualifiers and really choose who will be a member of that national team. This is unique for esports in the entire world that in a competition, you have national teams participating, some national pride. And I think that reflects to all the other traditional sports. The main question at hand is, is esports a sport? And this is something that I think we're always encountering. And this is something that traditional sport leaders seem to, with the coronavirus pandemic that has highlighted esports ability to assist in the mental health of all of the people who have been at home isolating or quarantining, to be able to communicate with their friends, to be able to play with their friends and have some type of fun activity has definitely brought not only the numbers in people participating in esports to an extremely high level, but also an interest in what is this industry and what's happening. For me, this question is very simple. Esports is a sport. Sport has developed throughout history from originally spear throwing or hunting as the traditional first sport in existence before Christ thousands of years to as technology evolved, having sports included that involve a level of technology. Competing against one another in a certain rule set that requires skill and training to progress with a target of winning is the definition of a sport. And I think we're reaching the, the point where step by step, move by move, when the industry can continue to unite in a very systematic way that we can reach the objective of understanding that this is a sport, it's not going anywhere, it is here now. And not only that, but the majority of the population is practicing it. We are talking about a population of over 700 million people that daily are gaming it's bigger than pretty much any other community on the planet Earth. And it's a community that needs to be respected and a community that needs to unite further to develop further. Thanks, Vlad. Um, and thank you for the segue because uh, now I wanted to, uh, um, since, since Abdurrahman was talking uh, about it and now you mentioned about it being recognized 
um, as a sport. Um, so I wanted to ask you, Tatiana, from a legal perspective, um, should esports be recognized as a, as a sport? And I don't mean that in the sense where you're questioning whether it is a sport, but would they even want to be recognized from a legal perspective with all the different uh, constraints, for example, that Abdurrahman just talked about? I, I think it's uh, important to, 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 to understand that uh, the esports as a sport is, uh, is also a legal topic. I'm not speaking about uh, esports. Is esports a sport uh, from a, a general perspective? I'm speaking about how it's uh, seen by the law. And in France, uh, we have a, a processes of uh, recognition for uh, sports. Um, esports is, is not in France for now recognized as a sport. Uh, beware, uh, esports doesn't have to be recognized as a sport by French ministry to, to exist, to be practiced. It's not, a, it's not an obligation. Uh, you know, you had uh, just recently uh, the mixed martial arts, which were not recognized by the French um, Ministry of Sports, which were recognized there, um, I think it's about uh, one year. But uh, they, they were practiced, there were uh, sports organizations, there, were, uh, there was competitions. So you don't need to exist to be recognized as a sport. But if you want to be a sport from a legal point of view, you have to respect some conditions and to, uh, to ask to the French Ministry of Sport to be recognized as a sport. And you have different criteria. You have the criteria of the competitions. So we have the criteria of the competitions for its sports. It's not a problem. You have another criteria that is um, the, the regulations. We have regulations in esports, so it's not uh, problematic. And the third criteria, which is maybe more difficult, is the physical activity. And it was the criteria which was the most contested. Um, because uh, you have uh, different ways of uh, apprehending esport, you have people who say esport is not a, a sport because it's not. Uh, it, we were talking about uh, about basket. You don't have to uh, to put a basket to to practice esport. And there are other people who are saying that uh, esports is a sport because you have a, a physical activity. And because you have also precedents in France, you have uh, the chess games, which were recognized by, uh, by eSport, but it's uh, the, the, the only activity which is recognized with a physical dimension, which can be seen as uh, less important than in other sports. So it's one of the criteria that are uh, maybe uh, more problematic. And I, I, I want to, to point out that the persons who give the recognitions are, are not uh, are not so 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 young, so uh, you have to be also ped pedagogical to explain to people who maybe never played esports what is esports, why is it uh, difficult, why is why, why it is uh, sometimes physical, and uh, we we had the same problem with uh, mixed martial arts because. Uh, people who were at the ministry, they, they didn't understand uh, how, does it, how uh, the, does it work, uh, how it is a sport, and, uh, and it's not very, very easy. And I, I insist on the fact that there are some sports which are not recognized. I spoke about MMA, but you have also horse racing, which are not recognized by the French Ministry of Sports but which are practiced perfectly legally. So we have really a, a, a question of posture. What does esports run? And maybe more, more importantly, uh, is there a, a federation who is willing to, uh, to, to, to ask for the recognition? Uh, thanks, Tatiana. That's really, it's really interesting what you say. It's maybe slightly, um, I want to ask, Vlad and Abdurrahman for their reaction to this to this particular point of what uh, Tatiana was talking about, whether some of the difficulties in fitting the criteria of what is a sport um, in in some uh, certain some countries by the regulations of their ministries and so on. Linking that to one of the questions we had from the audience, which is 
um, um, esports community appears to be quite much larger because of the variety of types of games and things than sports. So would you even want to belong to a smaller community in that sense uh, as traditional sports? So I leave the floor to both of you, whoever wants to go first. I'd like to jump on it just for one second um, with the physicality aspect, because it's a very important point to mention, right? Esports is so wide. It has so much inside and you, you can classify all esports from one left side, let's say, where it's the pure simulation of that real sport. And we can see this now with the Olympic virtual series where sports that are almost the same simulation are included inside. Then you have sport games that don't require the same input as you would do the actual sport, but the rules are the same. You move on to other games and on the other side of the spectrum, for me, it's esports that don't require any type of physical dexterity at all. For anyone who's ever played Candy Crush on your phone, not only is the mental dexterity required in the outcome of the result, but there are some games where the physical dexterity, speed, cognitive recognition are so, so quickly required to win that it's very hard to say it's not involving a physical aspect. And I'll take it one step further to say, let's judge some Olympic sports, not just chess, but how about shooting or archery or golf? Of course, there's a physical component inside, but if you classify all traditional sports, you have sports where the pure physical output dictates who wins, as would be cycling or rowing, to other sports like basketball, which was previously mentioned, where the physical ability is very important. But if the teamwork, the mental component, the strategy, and the skill, the precision isn't there, you can't win. So your pure physical output doesn't determine the winner. Esports is taking it just to the next level of saying that the physical ability is overweighed by the mental requirement. Thank you. Um, Abdur Rahman, do you have a reaction to this question about um, whether e-sport should be recognized as a sport, especially in terms of um, what you were saying earlier about the, the regulations and the conditions you have to, to fulfill? Um, do you feel that it's better to have this sort of structure for when you're organizing competitions? Or do you think that maybe in some cases having some freedom would be a, a better thing in some ways if it's not recognized as a sport per se. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult uh, and kind of two-sided question because in a way, as, as, the, que as the, the guy who, the person who wrote the question said, why do we want to be involved since we're such a huge community globally? Uh, and I guess over the years, uh, since the early years of esports, we've always been a community that is focused on grassroots. We've always been a a a peer to peer community. We've always been, you know, we created our own events, we built our own events, and and over the years, as as things became bigger and bigger, then we started seeing and you know, uh, and people started talking about getting into the bigger events. Why don't we have the Olympics of esports? Why don't we have all these kind of country versus country where esports always been team versus team and these teams are uh, are made of different people from different backgrounds. So it was just a natural progression that as a sport, uh, you could say, we're in the end of the day, we're all esports, sports. It's all about having that competitive spirit. You know, we're always chasing that uh that excitement, that uh, the feel of winning or losing and losing and coming back and winning. And it's just, the, you know, I think we're all part of that. Who are, who, whoever is part of the esport uh, industry or part of the esports scene, that's what we live for. That's what we like. We, we attend events because of that. We're chasing events. That's why a lot of discussions also happen oh, you guys are esports, why don't you just sit at home and play online, you know, since everything's online? Why do you need to go down to the arenas or the cyber cafes? Because, again, it's a sport for us because it's all about winning, losing. It's about, you know, sportsmanship. It's about having that uh, team or, you know, if you're in a team, you're in a team. If you're in a solo game, a single-player game, you're a single-player. But, again, it's that excitement. So growing and over as an evolution – do we, is it a sport? It is a sport. 
in the end of the day because there is, as everybody's saying, there is a physical aspect. There is a mental aspect. There is training that you need to put. No, you know, there's a lot of things. You're, you know, uh, your heart rate, your heart rate is speeding when you're when you're in it in that last seconds in, in a round in a game. So all of this is a stress, you know, that's the that's physical uh it is affecting your body, it's affecting your thing. And for you know, is the conversation. Do is it do we need to be part of it? Some people say yes, some people say no, you know, but Again, we're so you know it's 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 it's, it's, it's always evolving. Honestly, it's always evolving. I mean, right now we're the talk is will esports be part of the Olympics, and this is the big mission that the ISF and Vlad and everybody's trying to. They're working hard to make esports and have esports being part of those bigger global uh, sports events. You know. Thank you. I mean, these are such passionate responses and they just keep triggering so many questions that I would love to ask. All Sandra, let me, let me just, before you ask the next question, I want to compliment Abdel Rahman's comments with just one more point. Please. Um, everything that he's saying touches home and we are in the community, so it makes complete sense. But one thing that's important is that we're talking about a movement in the world, an activity that's happening today. And it is the responsibility of ourselves as leaders of international or national federations or event organizers to foster the, the educational aspect of all the participants in esports. Every national federation has a different strategy if they want to be recognized as a sport by the Ministry of Sport or if they do not. And every federation in every country has a different situation specifically to the requirements of what it means to be a sport, to having to abide by certain standards and certain moral codes for me to understand that esports five years ago was a wild west, unregulated, completely free to do anything in any way. I think there's a responsibility to this growing huge movement that cannot be ignored in order to provide safe facilities, to provide responsible gaming practices, to educate next to esports activity, also physical competencies, mental competencies, because in the end of the day, this activity is forming the humanity, forming the youth. And our input into this youth will eventually result in what kind of world we're going to live in in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Thank you. So, yes. so please, Atatiana. Yes, please. Just, just an observation because we are, we are talking about the meaning of a federation and uh, of an fed, international federation. It's a, it's a very uh, actual questioning because uh, I think we, uh, we all saw the. the the debate around the Super League in football uh, and the, the fact that uh, international federation or European federation uh, may be impacted by uh, private organizations. I, I think uh, um, the, the most important, and, and it's a good question to, to, to question the meaning of uh, the uh, federation because it, it will be always questions. Uh, so I think it's very, very important to, uh, to recall that uh, federation, uh, whether it's uh, international or national or uh, European continental, um, uh, the meaning of an international federation is to centralize and it has the ability to be uh, recognized by uh, international sports organization like uh, IOC, but also by a French ministry. So what, uh, what Vlad was saying uh, with the, the, the role of uh, centralization, I think it's, uh, it's very important because you can have a private organization. It's not a, it's not a, a problem. You can have uh, uh, companies in, uh, in eSport and uh, you, you have some and uh, you will have some. But if you, if you want to be part of uh, a global movement and to participate in very, uh, very popular competitions, uh, you can only do that uh, through uh, uh, an international federation. So um, I, I, I think uh, with the public protection, with the youth political protection, uh, the, the, the federations can, uh, can really have a, a role to play in esports. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you. I mean, you kept answering actually the question I was about to ask. So it's, it's really, it's really, it's so fascinating. So. We had, we had a question, another question from the audience, which actually talked about recognition as a sport, making it hard as, um, it may, is being made harder 
as a rule setting function is essentially in the hands of game publishers and not the federations. And we haven't touched on this yet. So I'm very curious now about um, the interaction between, you know, e when you organize competitions, but also organizing esports as as um as an as an activity um, between when you have publishers organizing competitions, federations organizing, but you can have also other private uh, organizers. Tatiana, what's what's your take from the legal perspective um, on all of this with publishers involved? Yes, as a, as I previously said, um, one of the criteria to be considered as a sport in France is to have your your own regulations. The, the sports uh, sports law code in France uh, provides that uh, a federation must uh, must have its own rules, and uh, it's true. It's not uh, it's not adapted to uh, to to esports because. As, uh, as it was said in the question, um, rules are shared, uh, at least shared with uh, editors, which are uh, at the origin of the gaming. But it doesn't mean that federation cannot fix their, their rule without uh, changing the rule of the games. Uh, but maybe there, there's something to work on uh, with, uh, with editors or some uh, agreements to, to, to have because it's uh, it's uh, actually one of the criteria, but it's it's true it's true to say it's uh, it's potentially problematic because uh, at the at the origin uh, French uh, French law and sports law was not uh, was not written for uh, for this kind of uh, environments. Um, the construction of sport is based on uh, practitioners who created their own rules their own sports, so, so they were uh, the owner of the rules. And then the structuration came with a federation, but the, it was their rule and the rule, um, the rule was really important to uh, identify the game. Uh, it's not the case in esports, so maybe we could have uh, an evolution, maybe a legal evolution to, to, to change this criteria or to, or to englobe other, other uh, other situation than the classical one. Um, thank you. Um, that's, I wanted to ask based on that to Abderrahman and to Vlad, what's your um, relationships with your, your respective federation and an association with publishers when you're um, just in general, even when it comes to, for example, education programs, um, as, you, as you mentioned, Vlad, but also organization of competitions, what's your relationship with them? Maybe I can jump on first since you asked both of us the question very quickly from, from my perspective. Uh, publishers are the oxygen of the esports universe. This means that without them, there is no life in our universe. That being said, every activity that tournament organizers, that the World Federation does, that national federations do to create events around certain games made by publishers does nothing more than increase the viewership, the demand, and expand the product life cycle of the games that are being made by publishers, causing a benefit to the publishers. Regarding Tatiana's information on the French code regarding sport, I'm happy to also inform you that in many countries around the world, they're at the moment drafting sport law about esports being included. And we're very close to different governments that are doing this now. And regarding regulations from the ISF level, from the national federation level, we don't need to make regulations specifically about how a certain game is played or the mechanics in a game or how winners are chosen or progressed or given powers or given abilities in certain games. Our regulation has to look after the welfare and the well-being of the kids that are participating in that activity, as well as promoting the influencers who are the best at those prospective games to echo a message of health, of goodwill, of building the future leaders of tomorrow. Thank you. Um, Abder, uh, Abderrahman, do you have um, something to add with, from your perspective of um, the Emirates Esports Association and working with publishers or even when uh, private tournaments are organized. Um, how, what's the interaction with publishers? What sort of agreements and 
and um, considerations are taken into account, especially in terms of responsible behavior as well? Uh, well, again, I mean, as uh, Vlad mentioned, uh, when it comes to esports, we live and die by publishers. If they if they decide that they don't want their game to be played, then it's done. You can't do nothing because it's an IP that they own. But over the years, we have seen and they've seen that esports have generated a huge amount of popularity to certain games. It created more communities. It created events. It created a culture around certain games that further, you know, terms dollars for them so it's money in the end of the day it's a business uh but when it comes to relationship uh, a lot of publishers are open they're you know they have certain ways you can deal with it certain ways certain guidelines how you just use their ip and then and then if they this is an ip uh and we come in and we run events using this ip so they have they have to protect it uh by giving us guidelines by you know upholding certain things by behaviors you know so there are especially even when you create their special events around these uh ips is just working together and they're 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 open they're always open because it supports their it supports their community and then if they, the publishers are uh, they care about their community they care about the gamers who play this game so having a scene having an esport having tournament it further helps them uh have a better product uh so usually you know so it's 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 a uh, it's a good relationship uh, very few publishers have issues e e e right now everybody's on board years ago you, you would have said yes it might have been difficult but now everybody understands the importance of what this community what esport is causing uh to these products and so forth you see now games are being made with some of them with the intention of being esports, you know, now you have one of the new games that we just released knockout. So everybody's talking about it now, a few days ago, is this the next esport? Does it have an esport potential? So the, now developers are creating games to see that some games fail, you know, they try to be esport, but it doesn't work. Uh, and some just naturally become esport, you know? Uh, so it just depends really. I want to just add one, one more Please. point or perspective to that. Um, Abdel Rahman mentioned the fact that grassroots is, is the vital component of our community. We're not talking about the elite. We're not talking about the NBA. We're talking about the huge community of kids that are gaming daily. And this community are not particularly playing one game only. They're choosing according to their feeling and sentiment and according to their friends that they're playing against which games to play. So between the publishers, the national federations are the engine of esports. The national federations are the ones that comprise the community across all the different publishers, across all different games. And it's very important to make sure that we not only legitimize, but unite at every level from the international to the continental to the national level, the full infrastructure, because our nonprofit objective is really the health and the benefit of the kids that are playing. And the last point I want to add on this topic is just that as technology progresses, I really have a feeling and a sentiment that soon kids will be making games that them and their friends are going to be playing. And this is something we're going to see, I think, in every other industry we've seen. When 25 years ago, the way to make a newscast was by calling a TV network that came with a car the size of a car with a camera on a shoulder and could make a video of you saying something today. We're all in the comfort of our own space, wherever we are on this planet Earth, but we're able to connect, link, communicate, and broadcast it to an audience. So as that industry develops, as all industries develop, I foresee in the next decade or two that kids will be more involved in programming and making their own games to their specifications, mm -hmm. their needs, with their friends, that they will play with their friends together. And that will grow in its own as more games and more issues. But definitely the, the part of regulation for the benefit of the kids that are playing, that structure needs to be completely unified from the top down. And that's why we fully support all of our national federations and the great work that they're doing. Thank you. So there is a very strong feeling to the um, protection of, um, of the grassroots level in terms of their education and their, um, their activities. Do you think, um, um, Tatiana, based on what 
um, Abderrahman and Vlad were saying about especially the emphasis they place on education. Um, do you think that in this case, when you're recognized as a sport by a ministry, there is more um, impetus, there's more of an um, obligation, for lack of a better word at the second, that the ministries can sort of encourage that there are education programs in place um, and such related activities to support the work of the federations? Yes, yes, uh, clearly. Because uh, sports is uh, for for the for the states, sports is uh, it's not the, the professional sports which is really important. It's the, the the grassroots sports and the sport from also a, a healthy perspective. It's uh, it's very important because uh, French ministry or states do not care about uh, about business in sports. They care about the, the fact that uh, citizens uh, will be uh, fine with sport, will uh, develop them uh, themselves, be in, uh, in good health, in good shape. And it's very, uh, very important. So when a sport is uh, recognized, uh, the, the, the most important obligations are to, to help develop and to have really a, um, um, a sensitive uh, approach to, to make sports uh, beneficial for, for everybody. So it's very, it's very important and it's a recognition in a, in a, public, uh, in a public way, not only in a sports way. It's not just a challenge to say I'm a sport, it's a, it's a good thing. It's also I will participate to the, the, to the society. I will participate with the general interest so it's uh, it's very important, and that's why um, I, I I think what Vlad said uh, just before is very important because if esports want to be recognized by uh, by uh, ministry and uh, almost by a French ministry, esports has also to be more than a sports, <laughs> more mm -hmm. than a sports in the common way. It has to be uh, something great for uh, for people, for uh, for kids, for young people, for uh, older people, maybe also. But it has to be uh, something which participates to the educational uh, educational objective and uh, and to and to the ends. Thank you. I dare I dare add that um, if it's also when it's recognized as a sport or recognized by the NOC in a country you even have additional sources of um, financing for to be able to carry out all these activities because while well, coming working in the lottery sector lotteries is an, uh, contribute a huge portion of their um, profits in many countries across the world to sports and the development of sports at different levels so that's that's thank you for that uh, for that uh, for that point I want I'm very conscious of the time, so I want to get on to a couple of questions from the audience, from a very active audience. Um, one of the questions that came in, which is, um, which is uh, really interesting and touches a little on something Vlad mentioned about uh, television and so on, is um, what are your comments, all three of you as speakers, regarding telecom companies partnering uh, up with entertainment companies to create an esports organization. Uh, and the example given there was um, SK, SK Gaming or Telecom Egypt and one of the esports teams. I don't want to pronounce it, but it's R A A D, Rad Sport Esports. Who wants to give a crack? You gave it to all three. Maybe we could start with uh, you, Vlad. Sure. I, I mean, the, the industry behind esports, the technology, telecos, software, from, from hardware to software to peripherals to headphones, it's a fantastically huge industry that's developing every single day. Of course, companies see the financial benefit in being involved in esports because it allows, us, it allows them to upsell or cross sell various products to a community and a demographic showing its performance and its ability. Any type of cooperation that allows easier access for gamers to play with their friends in various platforms is beneficial. And we fully encourage that. And I think from a business perspective, it works. From a human perspective, it works. You can see today in the sponsorship landscape of esports, the biggest companies of the world are involved. They're able to target a demographic that is there, which is huge, which can be 
to the to the to the micro dot targeted by country, by region, by habits, by age, by any type of, of requirement to segregate, to separate, and to to really give a customized pitch or customized marketing to. Um, not not on that note, but on another note, not to change the topic. I think it's an important point to talk about what is the purpose of sport. That's one point that we left out. The purpose of sport, in my opinion, is to educate the youth, to prepare the people for life, to be healthy, to know how to cooperate, know how to work in teams, to think. And in today's world, as the world has evolved from manual labor 100 years ago being the pure profession that there existed, the majority of the people today that are using their mind and their brain and their abilities to work has highly exploded exponentially. Esports is exactly doing that. For the youth. Wonderfully put. Thank you. Um, does do you have um, something to add, uh, Tatiana? In, just, in yes, just from a from a legal perspective, um, it is it is possible to to have uh, several organization. When I say uh, organization, it's not federal organization, but it's uh, uh, competition organizers. So it would be it would be possible to to have accreditation for a sports uh, organi esports organizer or organizers. So it's uh, it's possible and it's uh, it's upon uh, national federation uh, and uh, it's more national federation which are members or international federation with uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, I think you should have uh, something which is really uh, centralizing. And something maybe from the international federation to to to, to guide uh, national federation upon these topics. But from a legal point of view, you can have sports organizer uh, organizer which can be allowed to make their own competition, but with with the national federation or the continental federation. So it's possible, and uh, it's upon uh, national federation and maybe a continental and international federation. To, to regulate it. So speaking, thanks, Tatiana. Speaking from the national perspective, maybe Abderrahman, you have something to add to that from the national side about the um... Um, about telecom companies partnering up with um, entertainment companies, creating an esports organization. Uh, well, I mean. Um... As, as Vlad said, it's, it's a benefit for everyone. It's a win-win situation. Telcos play a major role when it comes to esports because they provide the internet. If no internet, nobody can play online, you know? Uh, so they, they have a huge stake in this. They see the opportunity. They are at the core, the essence of what we need to be able to be part of this uh, industry worldwide you know so to play with each other worldwide across countries across continents even uh so for them to naturally create teams it's it's benefit because then they're able to you know create certain products that are catered to gamers they, even here in the uae you have the telcos that are always trying to create products that are specific geared to gamers you know they're trying to get them because they are the they are the, the, the consumer that, that are going to get the internet, they're going to get the data plans, they're going to use the bandwidth. So these what who they want. You know, they want them, they need them because they're the ones who spend that money uh, and uh, they provide us the service. So it's this is natural progression. It's a win-win. It's Even now, for example, another just a small example, we have one of the biggest... Uh, video game retailers in the Middle East region, they just announced a eSport team for them. So, and, and, you know, it's a natural thing because they're in the video game business. They're the biggest, they, they sell video games, the games that we play, we buy from them. So now they came in and created an eSport team uh, using the brand that they built. So, you know, and we see that happening around the world, you know, from different types of industries, they're coming in and creating these teams. So telcos is, is, is the essence. As long as, again, they're providing the better service, they're giving the guys a better internet experience, you know, it's a win-win. Thanks a lot. Um, so um, one of the last questions I have, and it's from the, from the audience as well, is um, 
to talk about yes in, indeed these comp uh, these potentially competitive uh, organizations um, and or maybe complementary and to that and we had a question um, for you Vlad which was about the difference between the ISF and the Global Esports Federation because you've mentioned both in your opening intervention so could you clarify that a little for us please and the viewers sure uh, I, I read the question also I was waiting to see when I had the chance to answer it the ISF was founded in 2008 and is a union of national federations protecting the interests of national federations and supporting them. The GEF was founded last year. It's one year old. And if you ask about what is their target or objective, uh, I think that's a question to put to them. Regardless of, of how it was founded or, or by who, I think that the ISF is not only the oldest and the biggest national international federation comprised of national federations on the earth, which is a fact, but also the interests and the objective of this organization is really to support sustainable and competitive gaming and responsible gaming for kids while empowering the national federations that are the ones on the field who are working to achieve that as well. Thanks so much. Thank you for the clarification. Um, and one almost final question, which is actually uh, a great segue to, to what's going to be our third uh, panel uh, next month in the eSports series, is um, does the US, but I would, I would even extend it to all three of you, uh, starting with uh, Vlad, does the US eSports Federation bylaw provide uh, for an arbitration clause as to how the association manages disputes? Um, and were there any disputes up till now um, between the Federation players and others? At the moment, not. The activity is purely to prepare Team USA for the World Championship and to run all the qualification okay. tournaments around that. The United States market is a very complicated and dense market with lots of money interest, lots of huge players that are undergoing a lot of huge activity. We didn't want to step on anybody's feet, but rather to unite different stakeholders in one organization with a simple objective education and preparing Team USA for the World Championship. And that's it. Happy preparations. Thanks. What about, what about um, in the UAE, Abdurrahman? Do you know about any uh, arbitration clauses um, or dispute resolu resolution clauses in the association, for example? Not to my knowledge, no. Because again, we are fairly a new organ. Uh, association and as Vlad said our role is to further grow support the the gamers uh the local gamers uh and all gamers in the UAE to pursue esport as a profession you know so we work with again and uh, we're not trying we don't step on anybody's toes again as Vlad said our role is just to make sure everybody uh, is protected and everybody is able to achieve their goal, you know, and especially the youth, the gamers are able to uh, pursue the hobby, the, the career that they want. And our role is to guide them and support them and help them, you know, whichever way it is. But we haven't had any issues as far as I know. Okay, thank you. And then um, if I come to the European continent uh, and put a lot of that pressure on your shoulders, Tatiana, uh, but uh, do you, do you, have you come across that uh, at all with arbitration clauses or dispute resolution clauses? Um, you, could you touch on that just a little? Yes. Not, not in my knowledge, but the, the arbitration clause is uh, one of the most classical one in, uh, in sports area. Um, and we, we were talking about uh, centralization. Uh, it's uh, one of the one of the meaning of the arbitration clause. Uh, when you go before the court of arbitration for sports in Lausanne, you have only uh, one court which uh, we judge uh, every every sports issue. So it's maybe not for now one of the one of the goal of the national, uh, European, continental, or international uh, organizations. But I think it will be uh, something really, uh, really natural in the future, because when you develop your your activity, uh, you have uh, you have issue, you have uh, legal issues, and uh, and you have to, to think about the court before uh, before we where 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 you will go. 
and uh, maybe it will be the CAAs, maybe it will be uh, national uh, courts. Uh, but if uh, if the uh, esports uh, follow the, the the lead of other sports, uh, international sports organizations, uh, it will add an arbitration clause and uh, and uh, dispute resolution clause to CAAs. Thanks, Tatiana. Um, my very last question before um, we we close up uh, for today's session is um, a little about what tournaments are coming up. Uh, some of the big tournaments that are maybe uh, in the pipeline for next year, be it with the ISF or with, um, I don't know, in the framework of the Expo, which is going to be in the UAE um, uh, as of October. Uh, and um, this question actually came from our YouTube viewership. So from, from the ISF perspective, the World Championship, as I mentioned earlier, already has pre-registered 85 countries to participate this November. It is our main event, it's our biggest event. And the next year at the moment is up for bid. We have already several interested cities and we're looking forward to confirming that location, but more importantly, not only growing the number of national federations involved, but also the number of titles. At the moment we're at five, we want to push that as high as possible to continue to give uh, open space for the national teams to really represent their national teams that they're the best at. Thank you. And what's the biggest uh, thing coming up on uh, your radar, um, Abderrahman, in the Middle East? Mm. Well, for us right now, as you mentioned, the biggest thing that's happening here is the Expo 2020, which takes place this October as the World Fair. Uh, and we are actively currently planning an eSport event that will take place during the Expo. Uh, it's going to be a multi-game eSport event. Uh, we're still putting it together, even though we're a few months away, but we're actively working on it. Hopefully, we should be able to, you know, if we manage to close what we need to do, we can announce it to the world. So, yeah, so that's kind of the biggest thing that we're trying to do, which is on the biggest stage that's going to happen this year globally, which is the World Expo. Uh, and then there's plans for another Dubai eSport event that will happen sometime next year. But it's fairly, still early stages of development. Thanks so much, Abdurrahman. Um, so basically one of the big takeaways around the organization of eSports is to certainly keep in mind the, the importance of um, looking out for the younger players, for the grassroots kids, for the, the up and coming players that in terms across the board, not just of the way they participate in competitions, but also taking care of their welfare, their well-being, um, and um, overall ensuring that the, the environment of esports is a safe and healthy one um, and inclusive uh, as well. There are a lot of legal concerns to take um, into consideration. Um, also, whether and whether esports should be a sport, should it be? Is it in its interest? Does it even want to be? Uh, thank you so much for raising some of the possible ideas around that and the possible constraints and the the, the positive uh, sides of being a sport um, as well. And um, we could have come up with so many other questions, but we're going to leave it there for today. I would like to really thank all of you, all three panelists, for a fantastic intervention. I think our um, viewership would have has been extremely enlightened. I have for sure. Um, and you're doing some really great work in the legal, in the organizational sphere and in developing esports um, as a whole. I would like to remind everybody that this esports series doesn't end here. The next event is actually on the 10th of June, um, talking about uh, dispute, dispute resolution um, possibilities in esports together with the Institute of Arbitration of the Berkeley Global Society. So keep that, put that into your dates, same time, 10th of June. And um, with that, I would like to thank you all very much once again for watching, for speaking. Um, thank you very much to Oban, to Emma, to everybody behind the scenes, to the support from the Institute of Arbitration as well. Um, and we really hope you enjoyed and uh, see you soon.